Hey everyone, welcome to Film Snobbery Live. I'm your host, Nick LaRue. It's been a while since I've been able to say that. Uh, so, hey, we have a brand new season of shows for you. Um, we have, we're back from kind of an extended hiatus uh, that we've uh, <clears throat> both, we took because we wanted to and then because we had to. It was, uh, it was very interesting. So we're in a new location now. You've seen us all over the country. Uh, most recently we did shows in... We probably had, you probably caught us some of our stuff, our audio stuff over in Tennessee. Before that, we were in Los Angeles. Before that, we were in Massachusetts. Guess what? We're back in Massachusetts again. So, uh, it, it's, it's going to be a little bit different this time. I apologize for the kind of the lack of set behind me or whatever, because we're, we're still kind of figuring all that part out. But we, um, we are officially kind of back. We've already been hitting the festival circuit. We just got back from the New Hampshire Film Festival and got done covering virtually the Tallgrass Film Festival. And uh, later this week, we're going to be heading on over to the First Glance Film Festival down in Philadelphia. So busy, 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 and uh, wouldn't have it any other way. Um, we also were able to salvage some of our old content that we thought was nuked over on YouTube. So we're in the slow process of getting that uh, dealt with now. And hopefully that will, uh, that'll be good. And we'll have mo most of that stuff up in, the, fu in the, the near future over on our YouTube and also uh, over at filmsnobbery.com, where you, of course, you can find us every day. Uh, new design there too, which I'm really excited about. So uh, we have a, uh, an interview today, like we do at every Film Snobbery live show for the most part. Uh, this one is with Melissa Jo Peltier, uh, director-producer. Um, the name of the movie is The Game Is Up, and it's a documentary, politically charged. It's going to be a really good conversation. Uh, this particular uh, Film Snobbery live show we pre-recorded, so because um, we have to do a little test show before we get into everything. So... Um, uh, this one is a little, it's just a little different. It's going to look a little different, sound a little different from section to section, but you know, bear with us, right? It's the first show back. So it is what it is. Um, I want to, uh, I want to, let's see, how do we normally do this? Oh, I think we're going to lead into the interview with a trailer. And then when we come back, we'll have uh, Melissa Joe Peltier there for the interview. And then after the interview, stick around because we'll have more film snobbery goodness on the way. So see you shortly. When you're in the conservative media world like I was in, you are told to say every day that Donald Trump walks on water. I was told by my bosses to only say good things about Donald Trump. I told them to go. Most of our opinions about Donald Trump do not come from CNN or from MSNBC or from Fox. Most of our opinions about Donald Trump come from Donald Trump himself. People say, oh, I should get over it, I should move on. But it's like, how can you? I mean, they lied about liberals, lied about Democrats, lied about Trump. It's kind of hard to just move on. I know quite a few uh, people my age who are in the Republican Party who they're thinking about leaving the Republican Party. They're thinking about leaving this Trumpism, this phenomenon. I threw up the red flag, I threw up the white flag, I threw up whatever I could throw up as a warning that this was bad agricultural policy and it was going to hurt us for a long time. I was reading the Bible and reading some scripture and in the Bible and some verses jumped out at me. And I had to repent for that. I, I, I said, God, I am sorry for voting for him. What does Jesus say? Love God with everything you have and love your neighbor as yourself. Where is that love God, love neighbor, love self? It, that's the kingdom of God. And what we're living with right now is Christianity that is about empire, not kingdom of God. This is not a political issue. This virus does not care. It doesn't care the color of your skin. It doesn't care about the God to whom you pray. It infects, it spreads like wildfire, and it can kill you. Game over.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome to the show uh, Melissa Jo Peltier, a producer director of The Game Is Up. Hello. Welcome Hi, to the show. so nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. Um, so I, we, we've literally just watched this movie a couple of days ago throughout the review for it. Um, it's a really interesting uh, political documentary. For those at home who haven't had a chance to watch it yet or are just being introduced to it now, why don't you go ahead and give them the quick rundown of what it's about? Yeah, it's, it's, the, the premise is very simple, really. It's, um, it's people who voted for Trump in 2016 for a range of reasons and how they became disillusioned and, and came out of it by uh, 2020 and voted differently. Um, some of them were deep, deep, deep into the Trump world. Some of them were uh, not as deep in, but it's, it's really fascinating how each of them had their own reasons to vote, and each of them had their own reasons to leave. And uh, I just, I thought that it would be a nice thing to have in case people wanted to have permission to change their mind. And I do find that that's something that people, you know, in, in a lot of different walks of life, sometimes they, my, my wife is one of those people, like, who needs permission for certain things. I'm like, no, 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 you don't have to ask permission. It's okay. Like, you're your own person. You go do that. But, yeah, especially when people are feel like, have that feeling of not belonging or that fear of missing out on something or that fear of the being ostracized from their community or whatever. And, you know, I think that it's a very typical thing for people to talk about the the cult-like behavior uh, or mentality behind some of the the supporters but I think that there's also I think that also it's, it's somewhat of a dismissive term even sometimes when it's accurate um, you know I think it's a little dismissive it's like oh it's just cult-like behavior or whatever it's like no no like these people have deep-rooted feelings because they grew up a certain way um, there were you know some of the, the subjects in your documentary we're talking about like we were born into these types of families who are let's call them career Republicans or you know we were introduced to the Republican uh, way of of thinking based on you know these various things that happened uh, in in growing up or or within their families e- even you know some people we say there and say like how would you ever vote a certain way and it's like well it was very easy when your entire community votes that way whether yeah. it's from your church or your grandparents or whatever and um, you know it, it's it, I I found it just to be very very interesting in, in how you approached it too because. It came off also very non-judgmental, which I think that... I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah. I mean, it's obvious that, you know, I'm coming from a liberal perspective, definitely, you know, at the very least, it's obvious to the animation. But, I mean, I did not try to manipulate anything about the people or their stories. It um, felt like you really just wanted the the viewer to come to their own conclusion and just allowed even even the people as they were talking about their experiences, it wasn't like things things didn't feel as if they were being led to a conclusion. It felt like they were they were like here's what happened and here's how I felt about it and then this was the result and you know, I think that whether you lean liberal or or, or conservative, I think that it, it, it was it was persuasive, but not persuasive because you were leading someone to something. It was persuasive because of fact, and if you are a person who can accept some level of fact, um, that uh, that you know, which is is become debatable lately. Um, it 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 it's a really it it can be a really interesting kind of. Um, uh, it's a really interesting, I won't call it a story because story is kind of, you know, has a different yeah. connotation here, but you know what I mean. So um, where was there a, a particular moment in your life in the past, say, you know, since 2015, maybe even before, um, where you said, oh, no, this is now the story I need to tell? Yeah, um, well... It, it really, I, my inspiration for this really started in 2017. Around the end of 2017, um, you could see Joe Walsh, who, for anyone who doesn't know, Joe Walsh is, was a Tea Party congressman from uh, Illinois. Uh, and then after he left Congress, he went on to become a really popular right-wing radio host, you know, just real shock, shock and awe kind of. And um, uh, he with somebody I never thought I'd be friends with. <laughs> but he, um, he 
started to, on Twitter, in real time, I could see him questioning some things that me, from my perspective as a liberal person and as somebody who knew so much about Trump's background, um, I, you know, was, why aren't these people seeing these things? Well, Joe was seeing them and he was raising questions. I mean, he was saying things like, you know, yeah, Hillary's awful, but, you know, he was saying things like, like, um, uh, FBI, you know, why, why is he harassing the FBI? I wish he wouldn't. And, and so it was little by little, he was noticing things that upset him and he got more and more upset. And he started to, I mean, he's, a, he's a really smart guy. He knows his history. And he just said, you know, this guy wants to be a dictator. And, but it was over a period of time and I watched it in real time and it was so fascinating to watch it and to watch what things change, were changing his mind. He wasn't being told to change his mind. You know, he was just walking back on the ground. And so I thought he probably would be like the canary in the coal mine. Like a lot of Republicans would go the same way. They'd say, oh, you can't do that. You can't go against your own, your own intel. You know, you can't do this. But no, nobody said it. Nobody said anything. That's fact, crazy. People were told not to say anything critical of him. And that was really surprising to me because I thought Joe would be like leading the pack. But I knew that there were going to be other people out there who felt that way. There had to be. Did and you have Did you have a criteria of um, when you were trying to select the various subjects for the documentary that you were like, I'm trying to find people who are of this type of thing? Because I, I was really, um, I, I really enjoyed that you had such a, a broad swath of people who of who are different ages, different economic backgrounds, different um, cultural backgrounds, right. uh, etc. You, you know, I mean, I think you, you could literally have done a documentary just on Joe Walsh, and you could have, oh, yeah. and, and the, 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 <laughs> yeah. on, he's a great, I mean, he's a great storyteller. He's Irish, he's a great rock and roll. Mm. Um, and he just, you know, he's just, he knows how to, to, he loves to talk and he's good at it. But um, yeah, no, he's great. And he, you could do a whole documentary on Joe. I mean, the, what happened to him afterwards, after he came out and said, I'm not supporting Trump anymore, boy, you know, it's, we didn't go into that very much, but there were some scary times for them. Yeah, and, I, uh, I mean, it, it seems like that for a lot of people, that anyone who kind of came up against, you know, uh, Trump's ire was immediately almost, I mean, if we want to use a, almost a church term, excommunicated oh, yeah. from the Republican Party. And, you know, not only that, from a lot of personal um, relationships that they that they held within, you know, whatever their stature in their community was. It was really, it, it was, it was really interesting, especially I, uh, the, the young lady who was the, um, the Republican, um, student Watch. Republican. Yeah. Yeah. She was the rising star, right? And she was like in the whole, she was coming up at that whole turning point, Charlie Kirk, you know, Candace Owen kind of set. Yeah. Yeah. I, I her, her uh, background and story was really interesting to me, um, you know, because I, I'm 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 on the older side of all of that, obviously. But I, just looking at her her background, the background of her family, and right. you know, um, what happened to her in terms of you know, she's like, no, now it's time to speak out, and they're like, you can't do that. And right, I'm like, right, I'm, right. Yeah, it, it's and that it's, that was one of the things. I mean. I think if she'd been allowed to criticize him and she'd seen some give and take, she yeah. never would have left. But I think yeah. it was that because her parents, having come from um, uh, Soviet Russia, yep. uh, were Muslims and they knew what it was like to be Muslims and they told her that. And you know, they just are are huge worshippers of the of the First Amendment and you know, so grateful to be in America still after all these years. And you know, she was born and raised in America, but. They were going to have a child there if they stayed yeah. there because it was, and that was the kind of totalitarian society that they warned her about. And when her party chief calls her and says, you know, you can't say anything bad about Trump ever. Yep. She really, that woke her up. Did, did you find that there was any common throughput um, or commonality between everyone that you interviewed uh, that had their falling out with the Republican Party or specifically Trump. Mm -hmm. um, was there a commonality between every story that like there was a breaking point or there was just one thing that they 
that happened to them that seemed to happen across the board where they said, that's it, I'm out? Um, well, there wasn't one thing. Everybody had their own, their own personal thing. And that was another thing I wanted to show because, I, you know, it gets me very upset when liberals are always sort of painting everybody with the same brush. Right. Now, it's, you know, 2022 now, it's a little different than it was in 2016. But not everybody who voted for Trump was racist. People vote usually based on some sort of personal preference they have for something. Either they're a single issue voter or they have, like in the case of Prince Gibbs, they're really, their number one concern is agricultural policy and trade policy. You know, those are the things that, that affect them and they're sort of laser focused in on that. Mm -hmm. And um, so they, you sort of put aside the stuff you don't like and you wait to see what they'll do on the stuff you do like. And for, um, you know, Chris Gibbs, the, all the stuff that Trump promised about farmers, you know, it was a, he totally betrayed farmers. Yeah. And most people don't know that. Most farmers don't know that. They don't really know how they got where they are. Um, yeah. And because, you know, the media is really not telling us that. The media is not being as thorough as they should be. Did you, you know, as it's weird because you're almost entering into the conversation as media in a way, you know, did you, did, did you get, I mean, you're not a network, you're not CNN, you're not MSNBC, you're not a newspaper, but to some degree you're coming up to, to these people and you're putting a camera in their face and saying, I want to, to hear this story. Was there ever any reticence from anyone as you initially approached them to, you know, where they said, well, you know, how is this going to be edited to make me look? How is this, is you going to, are you going to tell lies like the media? Was there any kind of anything like that? No, because I think all these people by this time realized what the media was telling them. I mean, you know, that what Fox News was telling them was not true. But, you know, by the point I interviewed them, they'd all come around 100%. So okay. it wasn't like I was getting them in the middle of the process. I just wanted them to take me through the process because I wanted to know. I mean, I was really interested. And I was really interested in understanding how they could have voted for him. And I came back with more understanding of that. And I think that's really important because I see a lot of, um, and there's a lot of people who change their minds about Trump. Millions yeah. of them, actually. Um, if you look at the number of Republicans who became independent lately, and uh, you know, you'll get a what about is, um, oh, what about all the Democrats who became Republican? But, but that was not the trend in the last election, just you know, by the numbers. And uh, I think most of them don't want to talk because of their milieu, and they're going to lose everything. I think that that's the one commonality of all the stories. Everybody lost a lot. They all had the courage to speak what was true to them, and they were lost a lot. And, and the people around them were not only just like, oh, well, bye. Yeah. They were harassing them. They were yeah. mean, horrible, and hateful. And as our cult expert points out, that's something that's really common in cults. Early religion, shunning. Yeah. You know, shunning. The Amish still do it. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of religious sects that still do it. Uh, you know, the, the worst the worst thing that can happen to you is to be ousted from your group, yeah. you know, and, and treated as different and ignored. And, and most people, for most people, that's a bigger fear than a lot of things. And it's much easier to just keep your doubts inside and not change because you won't lose your radio show like, like yeah. Joe Walsh and you won't lose. But... There's, I don't know, I'm the kind of person that couldn't do that. And I think that um, uh, these people couldn't do it either. They, they couldn't live with the lie inside themselves. Yeah. No, and, and you know, I, it's funny because it almost comes, it, when you hear what you, literally what you just said, and then if you were to take politics, lift politics out of it and add LGBT people into it, it's mm -hmm. the same situation as... I'm afraid, you know, a person being afraid to come out to yeah, their friends totally. and family because they're afraid of losing something. They're afraid of losing yeah. their job, their 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 uh, their livelihoods, their their friends, their family, etc. In in you know, it's it's a um, you're right. It's it's this this fear of shunning and this this outsider mentality right. that you know is it's it makes it that you know that story on either side very relatable and and you know you hate to see it. Um, right. 
taking politics away for out of it for a second, let's get into the production aspect. So when did you guys start production on this? Because I know that this was, had some COVID elements to it as well. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to, to get into. So when did you guys actually start start well, production on this? I made a decision that I really wanted to do. I had this idea for a while, as I said, mm-hmm. and I didn't have any way to raise money for it. And um, I uh, made a decision really with Mary Carey Craven was my producer and she was like a force of nature and she's like, we do have to make it, we have to make it, we have to find a way to get the money somehow. Let's just decide to do it, you know, shoot the film. So that's sort of how we started and we, we raised some money through a pack and then unfortunately the rest of it came out of my bank account. So stressing over today, I put But um, <laughs> it was, it was you know, failure was not an option at all. and. Most of the, we had a lot of volunteers. We had a lot of people who were incredibly talented people voting for, you know, working for like pennies on what they normally work for. Um, you know, we cut, uh, we, we had a lot of tricks to saving money on it. Um, but and it looks great. I mean, the, the film looks good. It sounds good. It's very dynamic. Um, everything is crisp. It's clear. You know, there, there are elements to it that are, you wouldn't look at this and say, immediately say, Oh, that's a pandemic to pandemic era film because everything's on Zoom or whatever. Like you have a lot of, you have a lot of dynamic cuts. You have cutaways. You have good footage. You have in you could tell where the in person interviews are, the the non in person interviews are, and stuff like that. Like everything looks good. You know, every, every, for for a movie of its time, thankfully it doesn't look like a lot of the stuff that I end up seeing. Um, Thank you. you know, so uh, well, yeah. I think you know, I think that. You have a certain standard if you're, you know, in TV for so many years, and and um, and we did shoot 4K, uh, mm-hmm. but what we, what we well what happened was we were we started shooting in January. January was the IO caucus. That's when we started getting that footage in, yeah. and then um, and then February we went to New Hampshire and covered him in New Hampshire, and then we came back and we were getting ready to actually go to Ohio to Chris Gibbs when um, everything locked down. Yeah. You know, March 2020, everything locked down. And I personally was like frozen because, you know, I'm very classically trained. And, you know, so much of what happens in a documentary, in my experience, happens when you're there and you're interacting with people and you're, you're observing them like right in their world. Right. Um, and I thought, you know, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. But we, I mean, we, Mary, Terry, and I were like, you know, um, came up with the idea of like putting a mobile home together, um, like sending a kit out to people to film themselves. I was going to ask if that was something you did. Like, did you just put together a kit and say, no, 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 it just didn't, it didn't look, it didn't look good. I mean, you know, even with the, even with the, the, um, Logitech camera, I just didn't, I couldn't, no. (laughs) Uh, plus the microphone, you know, the sound wasn't great. Yeah. Um, well, and you're dealing, you know, I think the problem that becomes not so much on your side because you know how to set everything up properly. It's the other side, unfortunately, right. you know, it's like, it's like trying to get your, show your parents how to, you know, use <laughs> technology. It's not always successful, you know, and it takes yeah. a couple of tries. Um, yeah, I, I get that. So, um, yeah, no, I, so it's, so what was the what was the ultimate thing? Was it just ride it out or just accept what you were able to get and then try well, to fix what, it, what like, quote, unquote, fix it in post? <laughs> we sort of came up with a method that really worked for us. And, you know, to be honest, we probably wouldn't have been able to afford to make the film if we'd been doing it the traditional way right. um, at all. I mean, because my original budget was very high, you know, for funded film, right. um, just because there'd be a lot of travel. But uh, what we ended up doing was hiring either... Um, Either sorry about that. I have to figure out. No, you're fine. Um, uh, the um, a lot of people where I work, obviously, a lot of camera people, a lot of you know, were, things had stopped, production had stopped, and so we were able to make some really good deals with some excellent, excellent uh, shooters on the ground in the places we were shooting, mm-hmm. and. So they would go out either as a one-man band or a two-man band. We had a couple drones. Um, and basically, we asked the people we were interviewing, you know, what do you feel comfortable with? Do you feel comfortable having this cameraman in your house? Do you feel comfortable? This is before vaccine. <laughs> right. And uh, do you feel comfortable having, you know, shooting up on your front porch? There was a whole, uh, you know, do you want to stand in a park? One of our people wanted to be in a park. Um, so that's okay. That's fine. Whatever you want, we'll make it work. 
And then what they would do is they would set up the shot, and I would sort of work with them setting up the shot, and then they would put me on uh, a laptop next to the camera. Okay. So I'm interviewing them over Zoom. Well, which is fine because, I mean, nine times out of ten, you're not listening to you're, – you're not doing a two-shot back and forth anyway. You're focused on the subject. So yeah. that works. I, you know, I, um, I've had to do the same thing with doing filmmaker interviews at film festivals and stuff when I don't have right. the ability to, to kind of shoot, you know, on a two. So, yeah, no, that works perfect. Um, and, and it's it's great. I mean, it's it's so it's great because you have the industry insider kind of know know how as it were. But it's great because you kind of utilize this kind of indie uh, spirit to kind of you know persevere through and figure it out. And and yeah, it was that it was definitely you know this is the first independent thing that I produced by myself. My husband and I produced these shorts, and those are a whole different thing because it's basically two or three days of shooting, and then it's I mean it's, it's a whole different thing. Um, a documentary, as you know, is much more sprawling, and you have much more footage, and you have, you know, you're making the story, that you have to create the story as you go, uh, but um, I think that, for me, the first time I was ever by myself producing anything indie, and it's, it's uh, well, Mary really did the bulk of the producing work, and then we have a co-producer named Marilis Ernst, who's an amazing editor, and she did, she did the final editing, and we had some offline editors, and then most of them were just volunteering. So we had to, I <laughs> had real jobs. Um, and then she, she took everything and she and I worked to put it together and get it the way it is now. But um, it was um, it, very difficult. I can see why, you know, I, I went into television. One of the reasons is because it's so fast, you know? Yeah. You, you, you know, you do your stuff, you move on to the next thing because it's got an air date. Yep. And air dates are solid, you know, you can't mess around. And when my husband and I made our first independent feature, uh, White Irish Drinkers, in 2011, um, we were able to shoot it in 17 days because it was, we're so used to TV. Yeah, yeah I, I was going to say, do you, do you find that having that background, you know, does help because you already kind of understand how to streamline everything. Your pre-production is probably a little more streamlined. You understand how to make your days. It really, I mean, it's the only struggle at that point, anything either technical on the day and then just, you know, your typical, you know, actor kind of stuff. Just like, okay, well, I want to do one more take because I want to get this right. type of stuff. Right. Yeah. Now let's talk about real quick also the distribution. Um, so, which I'm sure has been fun. Um, and, and so has this, all right, so have you guys, you've have, have this has been out in the film festival world a little bit. Yeah. yeah. We put it, we started in the film festival circuit last September. So okay. just about, we did about a year of, um, festivals and we did very well. We, we didn't get into some festivals and mm -hmm. as I was mentioning to you before, um, I did get some letters from people who said they loved the film, but they didn't, their, whatever, their board or their festival chairman or whatever wouldn't allow it, which was really interesting. And I, I actually did send it to a lot of places where I knew I wasn't going to get accepted, but I thought, you know, at least the judges will have to watch. <laughs> well, right. And, you know, you have to get, you have to, you know, see if there's some reaction to it. How is the, all right, so, I mean, the quote unquote industry reaction aside, uh, you know the, fil the the film festivals critics like myself, whatever. How do you feel it's been taken by the audience so far? Have you have you had a lot of audience interaction about it? Oh well, every festival we went to, it was really popular with the audience, and they had a lot of questions. And um, you know, we won the top awards on a bunch of festivals we went to. Um, we Marilis went for editing. Um, uh, uh, Donnie Gillespie, who did our animation, one for animation. He's not even an animator. He's a he's an ar architect. <laughs> <laughs> this is his hobby. That's funny. And he just I just started him out with the, the termite sequence with um, uh, Chris Gibbs because I wanted to raise money off it. Right. And, and then I realized, oh my God, this is amazing. Now, if you don't mind me asking, is mm -hmm. when you were going out and you were you were doing the the fundraising, what was your your method? Did you do a kind of uh, like here's here's we're going to do a proof of concept? A you know in, in, in TV world, you'd probably do a story bible of some sort, or there would be some kind of a you know way that that would be show run into production. But did you guys do a, you know? Uh, kind of a proof of concept trailer? Did you guys kind of do a lookbook or, I mean, what, well, did, what? we had, yeah, we did. We had like a, a, it was more like a lookbook. It was, a, you know, a, a okay. pitch deck basically. Right. And, um, 
And, you know, we d really didn't get funded. We funded ourselves through a pack. We formed a pack, and a okay. lot of people gave $25, $30, $10, $5. And Over how long of a time did that, you know, materialize? Did, you know, a year? Yeah, uh, I would say about a year. About a year. Okay. I'm just, out of the curiosity, and, because, you know, you have so many people that they turn to what is ostensibly crowdfunding. The idea of doing it as a pack is really interesting. Like, I, you're the first filmmaker I've ever heard that's done it that way versus you know, doing, like, we're going to do a Kickstarter or, yeah, yeah, it or private hard. equity. Because, you know, some places didn't – I mean, the pack didn't end up – the pack only ended up maybe funding a quarter of it, really. Sure. But um, I think – you know, some people hedge about that. Right. And so, you know, that's the reason we, we finished, we closed up the pack and, you know, finished it. And I would not, I would not raise money for a film that way unless I was doing, I was prepared to say it's a purely political film, you know, candidate sponsored or something. Um, but uh, it was, um, it was a challenging thing to do. I mean, raising money, I can do anything. I, I started doing sound. I mean, I can do anything in the film industry pretty much. That's great. Life. But I can't raise money. I'm terrible at raising money. I'm good at, I, I can close. Sort of, well, I can't close. I can, I can pitch. I can sell. And then I have sure. to leave the room. I can't ask for money. I grew up in New England. So you don't talk Oh, that, no. Closing is, that, that's the one thing I can do. Is I am never afraid to say, but I have a background in like I was a car salesman. They Whoa, badger okay. you. I they, need somebody like you on my they, next film. Yeah, they badger you into saying uh, if you don't ask for the sale, then whatever. You know, I mean, I, I, I you know, for years was a walking Glen Gary, Glen Ross caricature of a human being. Um, you know, but uh, but no, I mean, it's 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 really interesting, and, and everyone, it, it seems like in the independent sphere. You, there's, you're always hearing new stories of, of different ways that people um, raised money or, or got it done. Now, you said this is your, this is your first feature that you've kind of completed that, well, that is yours. Yeah, my, my individual first doc feature, yeah. yeah. Do you um, see yourself <laughs> wanting to do another? Oh, yeah. I, I yeah. want to do another, but I just, I can't, I don't have any money left. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I mean, all things being equal, like like the, the process of doing everything you you you're like absolutely yeah put me back in coach yeah, like yeah. I'm, i would never do it unless i had um 90 percent of the budget up front right. or, or arranged for yeah. uh and had at least the production budget up front yeah um i would never i just wouldn't do it i wouldn't because it's just too it's too stressful i mean i didn't sure. sleep for a year and a half yeah. um and you know i watched my money market account go down 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 so you know until i didn't have any anymore and and it was like and my husband helped me um, but it was, it was really scary in that sense, but I had just one crack mind, you know, we have to finish this. Now, going back to the audience reaction a little bit. So did, you know, you're up doing a Q and a at a film festival. I find film festivals generally are a more liberal audience anyway, but did you, did you get anyone who was a, Hey, I was a Trump supporter and let me tell you what I think about this. No, no, I, we didn't get any of that, but what, we did get some people walking out in um, Ocean City. <laughs> oh, wow. And they realized what it was. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, because yeah, you know, they didn't want to see it. I mean, that's, that's, and that's the problem is, you know, the, the people on that end don't want to see what they don't want to see. Yeah. And so you can't even, you can't even propose it to them. And the, the form of persuasion that, that I would like to use, and I, this film is, is an example of that, is just sort of a soft, empathetic persuasion where it's the empathy with the people, it's the identifying with the people, with their feelings, with, oh my God, I was like that. That is that's a different kind of persuasion, and and I find it to be, it's less offensive. It's not a sales. It's not you know. It's not me, the Democrat, saying do this, do this, do this. But it's just like, hey, this happened. Here's some people happening, and we you know we definitely worked in some perspective about the cult thing, about his his um, rhetoric, uh, but but. None of that is, I mean, all of it is pretty well documented. It's interesting because I really feel like if you had, from an audience perspective, if you had a, a conservative audience who were Trump supporters, but you blindfolded them and took them into the theater 15, maybe 20 minutes into the movie, and then just said, just sit down and watch this, I wonder if they would leave because a lot of the 
like I said, the, 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 the statements and the compelling arguments that are made are made in such a way that it makes you sit and think about it and you have to sit with it. It's not a, a condemnation necessarily. It's not right. on the person, you know, like on Trump, sure, but not on the person and not a judgment and not a thing. It's both, it's really just like, you know, almost like hearing third hand, hey, such and such is such. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no. You know, like you kind of have to think about it for a second. It, it's it's a it, I, I think that the barrier for entry for the movie is literally the walk in and the waiting because you're just waiting for the first person to say something detrimental about Trump specifically. And that's where their mind turns off. But if you bring them in after you've already kind of like rolled past the initial introduction, I think that they would sit through it more. You know, I can't promise to the end, but I think they would sit through it more because um, I think they would see themselves more in so. in the, the, the subjects. But, you know, I mean, d- denial is a very powerful word. It really is. <laughs> very powerful. And... And, you know, more, it's more people don't want to see it, you know, and, and it's interesting because I think, um, you know, we, anyone who likes it, we love you to have to leave an Amazon review, but, mm. but I don't think they want to pay for it. The ones that want to leave bad reviews. <laughs> but, <laughs> You'd um, be surprised. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, we, on, on the YouTube site, the free site, we got a lot of like crazy, you know, crazy comments and stuff like that. But yeah. that's, you have to expect that. I mean, this is really, I wanted this to be, for liberals also to see that, you know, these conservatives who voted for Trump are people too, yes. just like them, yep. and to identify with them, and, and to identify that, hey, they made a mistake. They didn't have the right information. They had the yeah. wrong information. And when they got or they the right heard what they wanted they to hear. Yeah. Exactly. I think a lot of people did with Trump. They heard what they wanted to hear. He... Um, uh, Jen Merciata, who's one of our experts, she's a, a rhetorician out of um, uh, Texas A&M. She um, wrote a book called uh, "Demagogue for President: The Rhetorical Genius of Donald Trump." Yes. And she's like, no, he's a genius. He's not an idiot because he really uses a lot of very sophisticated uh, rhetorical techniques that, as she says, prevent him from being accountable for anything. Yeah. Um, you know, he promises you things without really giving you a plan. Yeah. Uh, he, he, uh, you know, he takes, he blames everything bad on somebody else, and and I'm going to come save it. You know, even if I broke it, I'm going to come fix it. And yeah. and uh, it's very clever. You know, and and he's definitely uh, he's he's not a curious man, but he's he's a very um, he's cagey. What I, I did an interview with him in 2000, uh, 1999, 2000, and, at Mar-a-Lago, and I actually was at Mar-a-Lago quite a bit because I was doing a, a film on the Palm Beach season. Yeah. And, um, and he was quite gracious, but uh, it's just, it, he, you know, he shows you what he wants to show you of himself. Yeah, but and, and that's true. I've, I've met him myself. I, I was dating a girl years ago, and her family were friends, and... Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, but um, yeah, yeah. He's very charming if he wants something from you. Yeah, if not, um, he's incredibly dismissive. Oh, absolutely, totally, totally. Yeah. In fact, I, in fact, um, and I don't think that people who who love Trump even know this, but you know, he. When I went to interview him, one of his people said to me, you know, he doesn't like regular people. He doesn't like to touch them. So if he doesn't shake your hand, don't take it personally. Right. <laughs> And he did shake my hand, and, and, and I was like, oh, I guess I'm, you know, a, not a regular person. But he hadn't been in front of a camera for a while, so and I had the camera. So, you know, it was a, definitely a, a transactional thing. Um, yep. But, you know, he was he was quite gracious. But he is, um, he's not, again, curious, he's not intellectual, but he's, I think he's got sort of a reptilian intelligence that's really, really quick. When and you were he's looking down to... now, he's getting older, I think. I mean, he's very different. He doesn't talk the way he did when I interviewed him. It, do you, how much of that do you think is put on for the camera versus 
I how he know. actually thinks now. I mean, because you know, you go back in his past where, like, I, I, I met him when he was a Democrat. Yeah, he was a Democrat when I met him. Too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bill and Hillary Clinton came to their wedding. You know, he yeah. was just just started dating Melania at that point. Yep. Um, yeah. No, he was he was a Democrat, but he was. He, he, but he's nothing really. You know, he, he's a. He's what he friend. needs to be for the th- for the goal he needs to accomplish. Exactly. 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 Yeah. He's, and he has no interest in governing, and he has no great love for this country except for what he loves about it, which is that he can make unfettered, you know, millions uh, and, and not get caught for making them in very, very shady and sometimes yeah. very illegal ways. Um, so going back towards um, the distribution part of it, do you feel as you were kind of going through, um, obviously, the festival system and right. then, you know, looking towards distribution, were you looking at offers that were, you know, on the table at all? Or was this a, you know, no, you had to look no, for... We didn't get a single offer, like somebody giving us money offer. Okay. Uh, we had a, a really good um, agent, producer's agent, Blood, Sweat, and Honey. Mm-hmm. And, and they really did their best. And I think, again, some of their rejections that they got were based on the subject matter. Um, yeah. Did you, know, you ever get any notes to change anything? No. From anyone? No? No. no. Okay. Mm-hmm. No, no. But you guys are with, uh, you guys uh, are with, I think it's Indie Rights? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. They're, they're, yeah, they're, they're really nice and they're honest and, yeah. and you know, they, they told us, you know, they wouldn't be able to get us on all their usual platforms because of the subject matter, but they were willing to take it on and they were really to, to put it up on their, you know, their YouTube site right away. Right. And um, yeah. I would only ask anyone watching this if they can, uh, if they do... Rent it on Amazon. It's only four ninety nine, and that way you have no commercials like you do on YouTube or Tubi. Um, just leave a, a, a review after you watch it. Um, yeah, it would be very nice. Absolutely, and um, got a great one so far. I haven't heard a lot of. You know, I heard one person did say. You know, it's pretty clear that the this is from a democratic perspective. It's, it's true. It is from a liberal perspective. I know. but I didn't try to put anything on the people that were talking, and you know, at the time. Uh, let's see, at the time, David Weitzman had become 100% um, a, uh, a Democrat. Right. But none of the other ones had. Um, they were still thinking. <laughs> and, uh, and you can you can tell. Yeah. You know, they that there, there was, there's conflict there in a lot yeah. of their, not their statements, yeah. nothing's, but you the, know. The idea is not, oh, let's, you know, let's change everybody and turn them into Democrats. The idea is no. just... People should see the hard truth, even if it bursts a bubble that they had. They need to see it, and then they can make their decisions. Like, people were saying, you know, about Herschel Walker. Well, you know, it doesn't matter that he paid for an abortion. You know, that, that doesn't matter. And this, these are the same people who are saying, well, yes, but women who have abortions should be locked up. So, it's, you, you could see, it's, it's not a matter of, um, of uh, ideology there. No, I mean, well, I mean, what ends up happening is, you know, some people look at ideology, but you have to, you have to balance that with this is what they say, this is what they do, and then there's this chasm in between, and if they're going to sit there and say pro life, they're going to sit there and say pro family, pro this, pro that, and then you know, uh, next week the article comes out that they've done X, Y, Z, you either right. have to live up to that and say, okay, well. Yes, but this, or you have to say, you know, he's the, the the dumbest take I've seen on that is like, oh, he was saved though, so none of that counts. And I'm like, that's what they said about Trump, and and that's very popular too. Um, we talk about that in our evangelical segment, that the whole idea yeah. of redemption, you know, mm-hmm. which is great, but um, but you're not redeeming. You know, fifty-one percent of the population. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. For, I mean, you're 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 judging yeah. them. And well, yeah. For I mean, for him, great for him. Now, how does this affect everyone else? That's where the problem lies, and I think a lot of the legislative issues that are happening right now is that yes, but we feel this way, and it's like no one is stopping you from feeling that way. But when you're throwing that on all these other people, that's where we have a problem. So yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's crazy. It's so. How, now you've you've been in television for a while as well. We talked a little bit about your experience as far as how it's helped you develop your films, but how, what kind of brought you into the creative industry anyway? Like why television? Why films? Um, well, my dad taught me how to edit film when I was nine. That's awesome. And, 
<laughs> yeah, and I made my first film. Was, my dad was like a film um, savant, <laughs> you know, film history savant. And um, and so he raised me very young. I mean, he was, he was. I, I watched Nosferatu when I was like nine, and I had nine nightmares for like three years after that. But he wanted me to see the the, the, the um, expressionist style. He wanted me to learn the. <laughs> he's showing me Caligari and and uh, and Nosferatu when I'm nine. But um, so I sort of grew up in that, and I just loved it. I loved theater. I loved film. You know, all the things my dad loved. I just happened to love too, which is lucky for him. And. Yeah. Um, and my mother loved them too, but my dad was like a crazy fanatic about everything. And um, so he taught me how to edit film when I was nine, and I made another movie when I was 11. And I was, um, as a little kid, I was also acting and, and doing theater. Um, I sort of stopped doing that when I, halfway through college, partly because I realized I was not willing to make the sacrifices to try to do it. Um, and I don't think I was a sex good anyway. I was a good performer. I don't think I was, I don't think I would have been a good actor. But well, I, I mean, love yeah. It, it, I love and, actors. I'm so like in awe of them and how honest they are. Um, yeah. I just, I love them. But um, I don't, I didn't think that I, well, I didn't really go that deep on it at the time because I had to get out of college and I had college loans and I had to get to work right away. So that's sort of how I ended up in documentaries, even though I, I planned to be, you know, I'd written plays, and I planned to be more in the dramatic end of it. Um, I didn't realize how sexist the industry was when I was in it. It was, it was incredibly sexist. Um, Do you find I, that you don't notice it because you're now kind of a part of it, and it's just this thing that's just everywhere? So well, it kind of... What, before I went into it, I mean, I think, you know, I always say that, that my parents made the mistake of raising me to think I was a person, not a girl, you know? Um, okay. And I, and I think that that is always surprising to me. It's always surprising. Like, what? what? Why don't you think? I remember I had a boyfriend who thought it was hilarious that I mowed the lawn. <laughs> and I'm, I'm an only child. Who else is going to mow it? You know? Me too. <laughs> um, but, um, but he was like, he thought that was hilarious. Like, you mow the lawn? That's interesting. I mean, people mow lawn. But it's, 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 you know, it's the end of the boomer generation is what it is. But, well, it's uh, interesting. I, I had a. I remember when I was working in the industry, and there was a gentleman I was working with in in, in post, not the one we were talking about before. But <laughs> um, there was a gentleman I was talking to in post, and and he was like, "Hey, um, if this person calls, would you mind taking the call?" And I said, "Sure." A particular reason why I said, "Yeah," because they don't want to talk to like they like I would have so and so do it, but they don't want to talk to a woman. Oh boy, yeah. Well, I had um, I had actually a, a, I won't say the name. Room, but I had a famous actor that I was supposed to shoot, you know, stand up hosting with who would not be directed by a woman. Um, and, and I had to bring in one of my, it was a, a show I was producing and did some, a lot of directing on. And um, I had to bring in somebody else and uh, basically tell them what to do. <laughs> and it, it was, um, it was sort of astonishing to me. And this person has been lauded as this wonderful human being, but it, but certainly not when it came to women. I mean, you know, I got the honey. I remember I was doing narration with him, and he's just like, honey, I'm not a salesman. <laughs> like, okay, I won't direct you again then. But um, but it was, uh, yeah, that was in, that was in 1990, wait, no, 1992 or something? Yeah. Do you find that the industry has grown slightly in that in a better direction since then i mean definitely i mean it's it's sort of what's what's you know the whole me too thing and the and the 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 whole you know diversity push in hollywood um it will i think it will eventually even out somewhat and not be quite so aggressive as it is right now yeah but um what what it's done the problem when i was coming up was how do you get the chance to show them what you can do and they won't let you unless you've done X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And, and it was, you know, it's like, well, we can't find any women to do this if they're not qualified. Well, that's because you never give them the stepping stones for the qualifications for you to say that they're good enough. Yeah, and, it's the um, old, um, you can't get credit if you don't have credit kind of, uh, you know, con, so to speak. Yeah, I, I get it. And, and, and it's, it's really interesting to see kind of the evolution of where things have been and where they are. Because I hear similar stories from anyone that I interview who's been in the industry, uh, specifically women, um, but anyone who's been in the industry longer than I would say roughly 10 years. And, mm-hmm. and you know, they all have 
at least one story where they go, oh yeah, I was working with this one guy and I got honeyed or I got, you know, oh, hey dear, will you I, go I, get me, go get me this because it's like, well, that's not my job. I'm, I'm, I was coming up. I mean, I was coming up in the, in the, the, the mid to late 80s and the 90s and, um, and yeah, I mean, it was, it was normal. And um, in fact, I was, I was on a, a film recently. Um, it was one of the films my husband and I produced and, and there was somebody on the film uh, who was being really gruff and kind of not positive with a department and the department were all Gen Zers. And, you know, and they're, they're really sensitive now to it. And I, I had to sit down. I mean, I wasn't excuses, excusing it at all. We, we took this guy to task, but um, I just, I had to say to them, you know, they were really shocked. And I, and I said, you know, this guy, he's a boomer. I said, you know, when I was coming up, they were all him. <laughs> Everybody was him. So, you know, we're going to talk to him. But, you know, you can't, it's not that you should expect, it wasn't sexual harassment. It was just, just it was more of a, like, a, a, you know, a military kind of style. A dressing of, uh, down, as it were. Totally. And it was, yeah. it, you know, it was awful, really. And it was, yeah. and he did, I think he aimed at more at women than men. But, um, but. I don't know really because I was doing my own thing, but um, anyway, so yeah, so it, I didn't think it was going to be that, but I did, you know, sort of dive in and I got a lot of great breaks and my first real mentor was a guy named Arnold Shapiro who did um, Scared Straight, if you remember that. Yes, I do. Yeah. And, and he did, you know, the original film that won the Oscar and the Emmy and then he did um, a series at the end of his career. He's retired now. But he became my mentor, and he's just, just like the most incredible person, and taught me so much. And he hired women in positions of authority constantly. I mean, his office is more women probably in his office. And the reason he did it was he said women will work harder; they ask for less, <laughs> you know, and and uh, you know, and they're, and they're more likely to do what you know what you ask. And um, that was his reason. But a lot of women got their starts. <laughs> that way and the same with another mentor of mine Dave Bell a lot of I mean it was really interesting when he passed away and there was a memorial for him and all these women who were like in these super high positions were there and they had all started like I did you know as a, as a PA or whatever um, and because he had he it wasn't just hiring women it's hiring women and promoting them to the highest position right. and that Arnold did for me I mean I was producing and directing and writing very early and um, that was really fantastic. And I, I would say all you need is one of those, but um, you know, you can't only work for one person usually your whole life. But no, totally. it, it has changed now. And I, and I think, you know, I, I've had some experiences where I know it hasn't totally changed. Yeah. And, I've, and I've talked to some people who have, but it's definitely, people are on best behavior at the moment, which is yeah. good. And, and because it's allowing more women and people of color to get that experience so they don't, they don't have that excuse. Yeah, and they, they're not getting, they don't have to, they don't have to fend off anything, you know, or anybody at the moment, you know, I mean, and, and whether or not the industry goes, you know, backslides a little bit or whatever because like i think you said like i think it's gonna it's it's gonna even out at some point it's very aggressive right now there may be yeah i think it's already starting to but but but, um which is not i mean i don't know if it's been long enough to really get to get all people infused in those positions where they can rise um and you know people that wouldn't otherwise have any kind of a shot and that was i mean you know the only women who were directing when i first started were Actresses who would work, you know, big actresses who'd work directing into their contracts, like, um, uh, I'm blanking on their names now. Well, Penny Marshall was in the early ones. But, right. Um, uh, uh, Lee Grant was one. Um, yeah. uh, some other, but they, you know, they'd managed to work into their contract that they got to direct episodes that season, and then the episodes got them a TV movie, and then. You know, they might get a movie down the line, but at least they were, you know, directing and working. And now it's, it's, I mean, it's really common to have a woman director. I still think they're, they're treated differently. I think, you know, Olivia Wilde's film, um, mm-hmm. I just saw it. I, I can't say. <laughs> I love the art direction. The art direction was astonishing. It was amazing. Right. But, um, but it wasn't my favorite. I loved her first film. But, you know, I think... The whole thing about, oh, you know, she had an affair with her actor. Well, hello, how many 
you know, decades has that been happening in Hollywood with a male director and an actress. And no one has said anything. Yeah, no. If anything, I remember a lot of high fives. Um. <laughs> and suddenly, so it's like, why is this film getting all this bad press? Well, I think, you know, yeah, everyone loves gossip, but but I think that that would have been a non-starter, you know, for man. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, it, it's, it, it's, yeah, it, 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 when when you see certain things get dominated like that, I mean, and, and uh, who, uh, what's her face? Uh the girl, the the woman from that was uh, uh, from Twilight, not the you know not the director, okay. um, the, the actress. The actress, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm having old. No, no, no. I'm doing the same thing. I'm blanking. But let's just say, all right. So she, I mean, she had issues where she was caught, you know, fooling around with the director, this or that. You know, right. she had to. She went through a few years where, you know, she was hard. You know, she wasn't getting the types of roles, whatever. But she's also now having a, a big resurgence to the point where, I mean, there's entire New York Fashion Week. Kristen, Kristen Stewart. Stewart, Kristen Stewart. Kristen Stewart, 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 where she's having an entire New York fashion show runways modeled after how she dresses. I mean, she's having movies where she's, you know, not just the lead, but she's producing, she's done done some, you know, directing, she's done a bunch of things. It's, she, you know, she's kind of had a resurgence, and I think that if it weren't for the time where things were happening, um, to her personally and professionally, if she weren't held up by those things, she already would have been far more along. Now, I think there's also the idea of, like, there's maturity that goes into it as well. Yeah. Um, emotional, physical, whatever. But I think that there are some people that, you know, end up going to actor, director, producer, jail for a number of years for no oh, reason no. other than just, like, we have to wait till the heat's off. Well, also, also women growing old. I mean, there's a, there's some yeah, ageism. The black hole, where you know, um, I think you know, it depends on on how much you're carrying your age. But I think you know, somewhere between forty five now and like sixty, women sort of vanish, yeah. <laughs> and then they start playing the the mother in law. <laughs> yes. But but it's like they were they were you know able to play uh, you know leads, romantic leads or whatever to a certain point, and then they're able to play leads that aren't romantic leads that are like, okay, I'm the, the police chief or something. Yeah. And then they sort of vanish because, you know, it's like this age, this sort of age vacuum that people like me are in and that's for actresses. Um, but it, I think it's sort of behind the scenes too. I don't know. Well, it's I'm sure. I mean... I don't, it's not uniform, really. No, but I mean, it, 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 discrimination to any degree is is there, and and sometimes it's not even necessarily so much blatant discrimination. It's just bias, you know. Oh, I'd rather not work with a woman. It's this because, uh, you know, and this is where, and I've heard people say like, oh, she's just going to get pregnant and she's going to call in, you know, for a million doctor's appointments, and then we're going to lose her for three months for maternity leave and blah blah blah. Like we're not going to bother, you know. I've heard that argument. I can't believe it. I can't believe they yeah. still say that. That's crazy. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, um, there's, there's certain ways that I actually got work because people wanted women and, and the same thing, I think women now and, and, um, some people of color now, and obviously you're probably going to sort, sort through some people who, ah, they weren't that good, but, but, you know, the one, well, there's, there's not many good men either. I mean, <laughs> that goes on both sides. So, so it's, it's, you know, the good ones will rise, and yeah. that's how it should be. And then if it's right. more parity at that level, then everybody has a better job. Is there anything in particular, any reason why in particular you tend to gravitate towards documentary versus any other medium of genre? Or well, not medium of genre. Thing, you know. I, just, I just started telling stories that way because it was, uh, honestly, it was one of the first job I had was researching a documentary, and then... I got to associate produce a documentary series, and you know, so so I sort of started in that way, and I'm sure you know, having been in Hollywood, there's no like ladder. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you sort of, and especially if you're freelancing and you're paying a student loan and you still got to pay your rent, and um, you know, you you have to go from job to job, and so I was getting jobs built on the experience of the previous job. Um, but I fell in love with the style of, of storytelling. I really, really like the style of storytelling you can you can tell in the documentary and. And um, I like uh, I like a sort of a form of persuasion that is um, more subtle. And uh, I mean, because you know, you could say, well, I'm going to do just a total a documentary that's totally apolitical, totally no no neither side. I don't care. 
or even like a history documentary. I mean, yeah. you are going to take on a point of view as a filmmaker. It's, it's impossible not to. Even if your point of view is, I'm going to be so careful to be equal. Yeah, That's it's still a point of view. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, I, if my point of view is a certain thing, and I really believe in it, then let me present it in the most, you know, Less, we fail in like, like way I can and see what you think. And that's sort of how I approach it. So um, uh, I want to kind of, I'm going to wrap us up a little bit here. Do you have any specific uh, things that you want to plug for, I don't know, websites or obviously let everyone to watch? Uh, the game is up over on um, uh, YouTube uh, or Amazon. Yeah, uh, on Amazon, Google Play, Tubi, and YouTube. Fantastic. So, the, the bottom of the tube and YouTube, you've got ads in there, but um, on Google Play and, and Amazon, there's no ads. And if you're on Amazon, drop us a review because it's, it's really great to see how, what people think. Reviews help. As a, as a writer, I also know reviews help, especially on Amazon. Yeah, they um, can help to find you, and, you know, so it's, it's a good thing. <laughs> reviews yeah. are good. Um, Fantastic. And I hear my dog coming. Um, but, uh, all right. Well, I, I want to thank you for coming on and I thank want you. to, um, you, no, this is fantastic and, and I'm glad we can make it work. And, um, uh, I, again, I want to, you know, just remind everyone to definitely check out, um, the game is up on the various channels. You said, uh, you're also on Twitter. If you want to have a, a chat with Melissa directly there, um, you're very active on, on your profile there as well. You're, I think you're, you're at, I think it's Melissa Jo Peltier, aren't you? Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, Melissa J, actually. Mel Melissa J. Yeah, my Facebook, Facebook is just family and friends, but um, we enough. have a Facebook page for the film. Okay. Uh, and that's Game Is Up Movie, and that's our uh, website, too, GameIsUpMovie.com. GameIsUpMovie.com. Fantastic. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Thanks. Well, there you have it, folks. That's our show for this week. Uh, once again, I'm your host, Nick LaRue. I want to encourage everyone to go check out filmsnobbery.com. Also, make sure you check out our uh, YouTube channel um, and definitely in, you know, like and subscribe and all that fun stuff, right? Smash that like button, uh, whatever. And uh, make sure you also check us out on Twitter, twitter.com slash filmsnobbery, Facebook.com slash film snobbery, Instagram.com slash film underscore snobbery. We lost the URL thing uh, that we had prior before we had kind of taken our little hiatus. Um, I want to also go ahead and uh, remind everyone, hey, if you are horror fans, like to read all that, uh, we have some uh, really cool uh, things for you folks over at Facebook. Uh, Fangoria. Oh, let's see, it's shop.fangoria.com slash film snobbery. You can get 20% off an annual subscription and also any of their other merch that are in there uh, that's in their store. So that's fun. Um, please consider checking out our film snobbery memberships as well uh, for just a five spot, $5. Not a month, just $5. You can become a founding member. Um, what do you get for that? Well, there are a few things. You have uh, we have a private Discord channel, private Facebook uh, group, and we also get some uh, as they start coming in more discounts and stuff on other things. Uh, for instance, one discount we have is a thirty percent off discount to Final Draft. Uh, so if you are a screenwriter, filmmaker looking to make you know an, your first movie or a new movie or whatever, and you're looking to update your uh, or get your hands on Final Draft, definitely check it out there. Um, once again, I want to remind everyone we're going to be, at, from October 14th through the 16th, we're going to be at the First Glance Film Festival over in Philadelphia. Technically, it's Phoenixville, uh, but close enough, right? And um, check out our coverage that'll be kind of still forthcoming from the New Hampshire Film Festival and uh, kind of the wrap-up coverage we have coming on, coming in kind of trickling in from the Tallgrass Film Festival. Uh, as always, check out all of our reviews and other stuff. Like I said, filmsnobbery.com. And hopefully we'll see you, if not next week, very soon. This is a, a nice little test show for us. So uh, we'll see you again soon. And, and hopefully, you know, we'll make this a regular thing again. So thank you. Good night.